The other week I was browsing on the Fragrance DIY forum on Reddit and I found that someone had gone and posted a load of perfume formulas. Things like formulas for Invictus or Dolce Gabbana by Man, Aqua Gigio and other perfumes. Now obviously these aren't the actual official formulas because those are secret and kept inside those companies but these formulas are probably formulas coming from what's called a GCMS analysis of those perfumes, essentially reverse engineering those perfumes. If you're interested in that process, then go and check out the video I did on it a few months ago. Anyway, while browsing through those formulas, I found that there was one which I actually had the raw materials, or at least most of the raw materials to make. So I thought, you know what? This is something I haven't really done before, so why not actually just go and try to make that formula and compare it to the original, see how close it is, and see if we can go and learn anything from it. And I thought I'd take you guys along for the journey with me. So that perfume was something called The Dreamer by Versace. Now, this perfume was released in the 90s, but since then it has been reformulated. What it basically is, is an affordable men's aftershave, and it's done in that quite kind of 90s, early 2000s classic kind of style. Um, it's It very much smells like a kind of a generic kind of exactly what you would expect for a low-end men's aftershave. But I don't think that's a bad thing because I actually think those perfumes are very popular. That's why they sell so much. And it's kind of interesting to be able to look at the anatomy of one of those perfumes and see how it's constructed. So the notes in the original one are top notes, lavender, sage, and mandarin orange. Middle notes, tobacco, rose, carnation, and geranium and base notes, tonka bean, fir, vetiver, and cedar, or at least this is what they are according to Fragrantica, the site which I looked them up on. Then for the reformulated version, apparently top notes are juniper, tarragon, artemisia, middle notes, iris, lily, and flax, and base notes, tobacco, blossom, and amber. Now, according to the actual formula, which I'll go and show you guys in a second, um, I can't really see like half of those notes in there and I'm pretty sure this is not just due to the reformulation. I actually think that when they were marketing this, um, they've gone and done the standard thing which a lot of brands do which is kind of just construct some notes out of thin air for the marketing description. Anyway, I went and got a little sample of the, I think it's the reformulated one, and I went and got this on a sample website online because I didn't want to go and buy the full thing. But let's firstly go and just on its own, see what this thing smells like. This video is sponsored by Luxeterra, my online store where you can find all of the essential equipment for perfumery. Only good quality and good value for money products make the cut and I use almost all of the products myself when making perfumes for my brand. To browse the full range of products, visit www.lux-terra.co.uk or click the link in the description. So immediately, it's quite diffusive and it's kind of got this, um, it smells like you would expect from a men's aftershave. It's it's fairly kind of diffusive and fairly like powerful. It's not something that you have to go right up to smell it. You can immediately smell it. And it's quite fresh. It's quite clean. And it is something that some people might describe as a bit synthetic. It's not like, um, it's not like a smell that you can kind of anchor say to a particular like natural it's not like something like oh this is a vanilla perfume or this is an oud perfume it's very much just a kind of um like let's just say a an an aftershavey kind of smell and when you smell it it's got kind of herbal notes in there it's got kind of crisp fresh notes you could maybe say i wouldn't say it's aquatic but you've got kind of like aromatic notes. You've got slight sweet notes in there as well. And I would say there's kind of powdery notes, um, almost maybe a slight hint of animalic, but not too strong. Like in the same way that Dior Fahrenheit has a bit of an animalic touch to it. Maybe this has something like that, but to a much smaller degree. One smell that I really do notice in here is the distinct smell of something called linalil acetate, which is a synthetic aroma chemical. And this is not necessarily something that most people would know the smell of, but obviously as a perfume, as someone who does perfumery, then that's a smell that instantly comes to mind. It's something that's found inside of lavender. And I would say it's this kind of general kind of um, 
synthetic, slightly sweet, kind of soft, um, a little bit natural uh, kind of smell. It's a kind of smell that's very hard to describe without smelling it yourself. Um, but I can definitely smell that in there. And you can definitely smell these kind of like herbal nuances. And I actually found that when I put this on my skin, the, in this kind of top note straight away, you really get this kind of muddy herbal smell, which I didn't particularly like too much. Um, it smelled kind of like, um, you know, just like some crushed up herbs, um, which, yeah, it wasn't super my thing. But I also found that over time as the fragrance evolved, it actually became a little bit uh, sweeter. It retained its kind of freshness. It has this, I would almost say this kind of crisp glacial character to it, which is quite interesting. So anyway, this is the formula. And there were a few things which I had to omit or replace because I didn't quite have everything for it. So I'll quickly go through those things. So firstly, BHT, I do have this, but it's a preservative. It shouldn't really affect the smell. So I ignored this because I didn't think it was worth the time and effort of adding it. Something else called diethyl phthalate. I think that's how you say it. That is usually just used as a solvent, so it was probably a solvent for one of the raw materials um, in there. So again, there's no real reason to actually go and add this specifically. Now something uh, called armoise, also known as wormwood, which is a natural uh, essential oil, and this is one that I don't actually have, so I just went and skipped it, and I thought because the level's not too high, um, probably won't matter that much. It's meant to smell kind of herbal and absinthe-like, and it also contains a lot of something called thujone, which is actually a, um, a chemical which is restricted by the IFRA. So because of that, it's actually restricted how much of this armoise you can put in your perfume anyway. Something else was tarragon, and I actually do have this, but I kind of lost the bottle at the time when I was making this. So instead, I actually decided to replace it with something else. I've got this thing called Toscanol, which I think smells fairly similar. So I decided I would just go and replace it uh, with that to begin with. And Toscanol is a synthetic aroma chemical and it's got this kind of herbal aniseed like smell, just like tarragon does. So then I don't actually have alpha methyl ionone. I've only got alpha isomethyl ionone or methyl ionone gamma, which is actually already in the formula. So I thought let's just top up the um, alpha isomethyl ionone or the methyl ionone gamma with um, the amount that should have been for the alpha methyl ionone. If that uh, ionone nomenclature, the naming is confusing to you, then don't worry too much about it because uh, most ionones smell pretty similar to one another anyway, um, which means that they are quite replaceable within themselves. Now another thing is it says not to use Ambronol 95, just to use Ambronol. And I've only got Ambronol 95, but I did some research online and from what I could find, it's pretty much the same molecule or just a different manufacturing process um, or a different ratio of isomers, something like that. Um, and from what I could tell, I didn't really see any reason that using Ambronol 95 instead of Ambronol should be that much of a deal breaker, at least just to get a rough idea of how it smells. So I thought, let's just go and use that anyway. And I initially thought, let's actually just go and use half as much, just in case, um, because we're not using the right one, just in case this one's like too strong or something like that. So I went and did that. And then finally, there's something called Lyral, which is actually now banned in the EU and I don't have it anyway, so I thought let's try to replace it. Now, Lyral is a lily of the valley, so a kind of fresh floral smelling uh, molecule, and apparently while it is fairly unique uh, within that category, um, a lot of people have been looking at how to replace it in their perfumes because it was banned quite recently, so there are a lot of perfumes which use this Lyral, which um, they now had to kind of reformulate and replace with something else. So I went looking online and I found that someone called Paul Kyler had suggested a kind of rough framework for replacing Lyral, and that was to use 50 parts lily floor, 10 parts uh, male, 15 parts hydroxy citronellal dimethyl acetal, though I just use hydroxy citronellal because I don't have the dimethyl acetal version, and then finally five parts hedione HC or high cis hedione and yes this only adds up to 90 not 100 but that's fine we can work with it. So I went and kind of made that um, inside my formula that little accord to pretty much the same amount that the 
Lyral would have been in the hope that it's going to give us a rough same effect for that kind of fresh lily of the valley element that the perfume should have in it. So this is a formula that I wrote out. Now when you look at it, you won't necessarily immediately notice straight away that it's the same as the one, um, the original formula, but do um, believe me, it is pretty much the same thing. It's just, I've taken out the things that have been missing um, and done those replacements, like I said, and then kind of scaled the whole thing very slightly, but the relative proportions are still um, pretty much the same between the things. So I went and rewrote this formula in my formula app. If you're interested in that, then do check it out in the link in the description. It's a tool which helps you uh, do these things like rearranging your formulas. The main reason for rearranging the formula was because firstly, I didn't want to go and make like a thousand grams or whatever the original one is done in because it's parts per thousand. I wanted to make a smaller amount and I also wanted to make use of the 10% dilutions, which I already have for a lot of raw materials for making them easier to work with. Um, so essentially what I did was just shuffle the numbers about to allow me to go and make up the same formula, but by using um, different dilutions and make a smaller amount overall. So here is the first uh, one that I had, and I made two in total. I made this first one, and then based on my feedback, I actually went and shifted a few things around to make a second version, which I thought was a little bit improved. But anyway, for now, let's talk about the first one. So first impressions, uh, when smelling this, I was really actually surprised at just how similar this smelled to the original. You can definitely tell them apart. They're not completely identical, um, but I was pretty impressed still at how close that they are to each other. You can still tell that they're pretty much roughly the same thing. Now, what I did notice was mine um, did have some key differences. So. So what it did have to start with is it definitely had that same kind of like general um, some like projection, especially the top note, um, or at least that initial kind of feeling you got um, was quite similar. And the kind of intensity was about the same and a lot of the kind of freshness, those kind of linalyl acetate, um, that kind of smell um, was quite similar, which isn't surprising since if you go and look at the formula, that's actually the biggest uh, ingredient or the strongest raw material, as it so turns out. So firstly, the herbal note was a bit different. Um, the herbal note in the original was a bit more muddy and kind of complex and natural. I assume that's due to the tarragon and the armoise essential oils, which I didn't have in mind. And I do notice that that Toscanol, that um, kind of replacement for the tarragon, that synthetic aroma chemical that smells quite ansi-like, um, in my version, that's actually very prominent, and that's just probably because that aroma chemical doing a one-to-one -one, uh, replacement for the tarragon was probably a bit overkill because usually um, synthetics are quite a bit stronger than their respective kind of, let's say, natural counterparts. So yeah, you get the stronger note of the Toscanol, but a bit of a different herbal note kind of overall. This version's a lot cleaner in the top note than the original. And... I was quite impressed, especially with the top note, how similar it was, but then I did find that as you go into the mid and bass note region, um, this version really did seem to kind of fall away a little bit more. I felt that the bass note in this was a little bit kind of harsh and it didn't smell that amazing. It just smelled kind of like Hedio and Isui Super um, and you could smell kind of hints of the ambranol and things, but it didn't really smell um, nicely blended and balanced. Whereas in the original, after smelling the base note of this, you suddenly noticed how kind of well-rounded it was. It had um, kind of lots of, it had a subtle sweetness to it. It had um, kind of slight woody parts to it. It had um, slight coumarinic elements. So it had uh, just like a, a very nice kind of blend. It's just a, a well-balanced, well-rounded bass note. And I'm going to have to assume that the perfumer who made this perfume probably constructed the actual bass note, maybe using um, bases. So like, for example, a very complex bass note with uh, things in minute traces that weren't necessarily picked up on the GC or something like that. Another possibility is that they're actually using some kind of captive molecule in the original that maybe wasn't picked up on the GC. Or finally, it could have just been down to the fact that um, 
either I missed out a couple of things and replaced them, or the fact that the reformulated version was kind of different from the original, because the one I smelled was the reformulated one. So potentially they used some kind of um, more modern things in the base note, which weren't in the original, which is what this formula is meant to be based off of. Maybe when they reformulated it, I don't know why they did that. It could have been to replace something restricted, but at the same time, they might have decided to um, go and improve the bass note again or something like that as well. So yeah, the bass note just wasn't quite as good in my version. And I did feel like that um, after smelling um, this one and my one and then the original one, I did feel that the original one had a slight more kind of almost cinnamon leaning part to the bass note and a kind of like, let's say, um, the kind of slight animalic kind of a sweet ambery, like almost raspberry um, kind of part to the bass note was completely kind of missing uh, in my one as well. I also felt that my one had less of this kind of a crisp glacial note from the original, and I'm gonna assume that that's probably down to the thujone um, from the uh, wormwood or the uh, armoise oil. I think potentially that could have been part of that uh, no. Since we'd already got this out, I thought I would actually go and do another trial, making some slight adjustments to see if I could get something that was just a little bit closer to the original. So what I decided to do was firstly lower that Toscanol quite a lot, um, because I just thought it was overpowering, but I wanted to keep a little bit of it just to give a touch of ansi like tarragon wood. And I also added a little bit of star anise, um, because I thought um, that would be quite similar again to the tarragon smell. Um, because it's got some similar um, constituent components. Then, instead of all of this um, alpha methyl ionone that I had gone and just topped up um, the alpha isomethyl ionone with, I actually went and took that quantity back out, and, and this time I used alpha irone because I read online that alpha irone is actually uh, more similar in smell to the alpha methyl ionone. Then I went and took the Ambranol 95 and added it, whacked it back up to the original level, again ignoring the fact that they said in the formula not to use 95, um, because I felt that that kind of like amberiness was missing, and potentially part of the bass note um, being having less of that kind of uh, like sweet ambery note to it could be uh, part of that. Then I decided to add a tiny bit of a cinnamon base and a tiny bit of anise aldehyde, which is kind of like a cherry smelling note. And um, because again, I thought those two kind of um, aspects were let's say missing when comparing my previous version to the original. And then finally, I decided to add in a little bit of geranyl acetate because in my mind, this aroma chemical gives this kind of glacial uh, feeling. I don't know why. And I thought maybe this could compensate um, for the loss of the iciness that's presumably down to the thujone containing naturals being a bit lower. And also geranyl acetate blends pretty well with linalool acetate. So I thought it would naturally fit into the composition anyway. Um, I thought it wouldn't, you know, there was a low chance of it, let's say going wrong. Now, in my opinion, this was definitely an improvement to the first one. The main reason at least just being because at least now the Toscanol wasn't overpowering it, so we didn't have this kind of um, strong departure from the original in there being this uh, strong anseed note that wasn't there before. This time, I really felt like it was, um, at least to begin with, um, very, very similar to the original. I feel like this is like 90% of the way there or something like that. And again though, when we did get into the base notes, it still did the same thing and fell apart. Um, potentially the things that I went and added just weren't the right things to add and or potentially that we didn't go and add them, let's say at high enough levels to actually make an effect. I think it was probably the former. It probably just wasn't the right things. When smelling the original and then smelling this one, and smelling the original, you really feel like you're almost smelling the same thing, which is pretty pretty cool. But when you do that comparison, you notice that this version relies more on those kind of strong, fresh notes that really make up the character of the fragrance. But then going back to the original, the appearance of these kind of uh, sweeter, rounded bass notes. So maybe almost as if there's like a touch of things like slight vanilla, ambery 
cherry, things like that, um, that you never really noticed in the smell before, they suddenly become apparent. So, yeah, if you wanted to make a one-to-one -one copy, for whatever reason, then there's definitely more work to be done. But luckily, I'm not too fussed about that. What I'm more interested in is actually seeing what we can learn from this. And one thing that I definitely learned from making this is building a composition around linalyl acetate. And I felt that this composition was somewhere between a classic cologne, uh, but more maybe leaning towards a fougere composition, but a modern fougere. And I went and looked at the formula and I picked out what I thought were probably the core parts of this structure. So I feel like linalyl acetate, obviously massive ingredient in here, bergamot, hedione, galaxolide and tonalide, so this kind of musk complex, dihydromersinol, that classic thing used in these uh, men's aftershaves, ambrox super, the classic thing that it's paired with, and then a little bit of coumarin, so tonka actually used in this formula, uh, Tonka Beans Absolute is kind of essentially just a more fancy version of Coumarin. It's like a natural that's mostly composed of Coumarin. So, uh, yeah, and then Allyl Amyl Glycolate, which is, um, some people would say, a pineapple-leaning note. Um, but I really felt like these things really were the core of this composition. So you could just go and take those on their own and get this, like, nice generic perfume base, let's call it, for a this kind of just generic um, like affordable men's aftershave uh, kind of thing. So it's this kind of like clean modern fougere, right? And so you've got the you've got the musks there as a the base, you've got the dihydromersinol and ambrox super creating that classic kind of distinctive um, you know uh, like men's aftershave feel. Then you've got like a bit of coumarin, that's a bit more from a traditional fougere, sweetening up the base note. You've got like uh, linalyl acetate providing this big kind of dose of like crisp freshness and what I would really consider it as is just a clean, very modern version of lavender. And then you've got bergamot adding a kind of um, impact um, and freshness because it's like a citrusy kind of thing that essentially blends into linalyl acetate because it's got linalyl acetate in it itself. And then you've also got Hedione for a big kind of uh, fresh, clean, um, diffusive kind of projection in there as well. Now, as well as that, you've got some other things. So I would say then the Lily of the Valley, um, so the Lyral or whatever you're replacing it with, and the Aldehyde C12 M and A. To me, these are these kind, this kind of optional addition, which are these really fresh notes. So if you want it to smell more like clean, soapy, fresh, and kind of light, that kind of thing, then you go and add in these, or if you really want to push that, then you can go and really try to overdose them even more. But that's kind of how you would go and bend that core structure to be fresher. Then you've got everything else, which I would say is pretty much unique to this perfume or giving it what makes it distinct. So in this case, you've got these kind of like herbal essential oils, so things like the armoires, the tarragon, juniper, um, the sage. That is basically um, this kind of, from my point of view, this kind of unique herbal character that it's got. So you know how you smell in this perfume, those like herbal notes in the opening. I feel like that is specifically trying to be um, like the identity of this perfume. What makes it unique? Because you could have put anything else as a top note. And then you've also got um, kind of the ambranol, the ionones, and the slight touch of damascone, I would say, as um, other ways that it's being coloured in specifically. So the ionones, they make it kind of a bit more fuzzy, a bit uh, warmer, a bit fruitier. The damascone definitely makes it a little bit fruitier. Then you've also got the ambranol, which brings this uh, kind of ambery, slight animalic side, which I also think kind of maybe offsets a bit the freshness. It kind of um, gives you something a bit more interesting there. It makes it a bit less one-dimensional. So I don't feel like these three things are really necessary for that uh, men's aftershave fougere structure, but what all of them do is they definitely help with performance because they're all kind of very strong, impactful notes. And by adding them, it slightly kind of bends the composition to, again, its own let's say, slightly more uh, unique way of doing things. This is just my kind of first level take on the whole thing, though, so don't take this kind of analysis as set in stone. It's just kind of 
what I take from it when I look at the formula after having smelled it. I do also think that the formula showcases really well how to use aldehyde C12, M and A and ambranol. And the reason for this is, well, these two things, they don't smell that nice on their own. Um, to me, aldehyde C12, M and A smells just strongly like soap, which you don't necessarily want to smell like because you just smell like a bar of soap. And then ambranol smells like this kind of really musty, stale air, like old stuff, you know, just not super nice. Now, normally with uh, these kind of not so nice or very strong things, what you should know that you need to do as a perfumer in order to be able to employ them or use them is you just need to dose them really low. But I find that it's not necessarily that intuitive to know A, how low to dose them and B, what context they can actually be used uh, well in. It's much easier to use something when it already smells very nice because you could imagine, oh, maybe this goes nicely with that. But if something on its own doesn't smell so nice, then it's less intuitive to think, oh yeah, we need to add some of this into this formula, you know? So this formula is useful in that it shows you specifically how you can make use of these two raw materials, aldehyde C12, MNA. In this case, it's really just adding freshness, especially in that uh, like impact in the top note. It's really just pushing in and making the whole thing fresher and cleaner. So I would say it's showing that specifically in this kind of linalyl acetate style of composition, um, where you've got these kind of uh, fresh, like synthetic um, things. You've got like a, a lot of linal acetate and then you've got um, things like dihydromersinol in there and that kind of structure. It shows that just a little bit of C12 MNA can make it a bit cleaner, fresher, um, and that soapiness actually doesn't come through necessarily now as distinct soapiness. It just subtly comes through as kind of, let's say, tuning up the the cleanliness and the freshness of this uh, formula. Then for the ambranol, in this case, what it seems to be doing is um, with such a fresh composition, um, but I don't necessarily think you'd need to have such a fresh composition, but it really creates in the base note at this low level, um, it creates a kind of, it actually adds this, I would say, a warmth. It kind of creates substance and, it doesn't smell kind of musty and horrible and dirty anymore at this low level. It actually um, adds a sweet amberiness. So I guess that's where the ambranol name must have come from. Um, but it's definitely an alternative to the labdanum style of amber, which smells quite leathery. Um, actually, this um, smells, I think it's possibly some of the reason that the cherry smell might be coming through actually. But it actually, um, just at the low, this low level, it seems in the base note to create this kind of general um, diffusive kind of warm warm note, which is hard to describe, um, but I would say maybe play around with it and see where it gets you. Another thing that this whole exercise uh, reminded me of, which I found interesting was about a year ago, I did a collaboration with Clement CC, who is another YouTuber, and she showed me um, a copycat version of Dior Sauvage. And when I smelled it, initially I was like, wow, this is really nice. But um, after five minutes or so on the scent strip, it suddenly uh, devolved to a smell that was more like a Radox shower gel. So just a really cheap um, shower gel that you would buy in a supermarket. And it made me think that, wow, in this clone, Initially when you spray it, it smells really close, but then it falls away, especially into the base note. And I felt like this was pretty much the same thing. I'm not saying that this is the case necessarily for all clones, but it may it made me just think, oh, it's interesting this happened because this initially they do really smell uh, very similar, especially that second trial I made to the original or the reformulation, let's say. But then after a while, the longer you leave it, the further and further apart they seem to go. They just diverged. You notice how the real one, it has this nicely rounded, balanced bass note. Whereas this version, um, it was just kind of a harsher bass note. It was, um, it was just a bit more, let's say, spiky. It didn't have so much harmony and it just didn't smell as nice. So I think that was quite interesting too. Now, I don't know if this is like a systematic thing. Is it, um, is it, I really can't think what the reason would be that in general, um, GCMS analysis don't do as well as reconstructing base notes than um, 
top notes. I, I don't know if it's, it might not actually be a general rule. It might just be a coincidence that it happened these two times, but I will keep an eye out for it in the future in case I smell some more of these things. Um, because just in case it may be, it may be some kind of systematic thing as to why this is happening. Now, finally, I think the most important thing to learn from this whole exercise is the importance of learning to compose good bass notes. And the reason I say that is because specifically this in this reconstruction, it was the bass note that was the bit that I couldn't actually work out how to replicate. And that's what set the original version apart. And if you go and look at Jean Carles, who is a famous perfumer um, from the last century, if you go and look at his uh, guidance to trainee perfumers, he says, or he emphasizes the importance of composing bass notes and really um, the importance of doing lots of different trials for bass notes and really getting the balance right there. And I've heard a similar thing mentioned by other perfumers uh, talking about the number of trials they do with bass notes. And it makes sense, right? Because I guess the bass notes are the things that last the longest in your perfume. They're the only thing that's gonna stay the whole time. And often um, bass notes don't necessarily always smell as nice. And also there are not so many of them. So to find creativity and really good harmonies and compositions within your bass notes, I think is a really important skill in perfumery. Usually I find the top notes, most top notes smell pretty nice. Like you've got orange essential oil, um, you've got fruits and things like that. And normally you just chuck in a tiny amount and it makes your perfume um, that have this nice kind of initial impact when you spray it and it's got this nice uh, smell. But with the bass notes, um, you get a lot of more kind of thick, heavy things. You get more kind of sometimes musty bass notes or uh, say like certain woods which don't smell so nice straight away but they slowly uh, kind of evolve. Um, so I think that this whole thing just shows that if you wanna be able to compose really good perfumes then you really need to be able to compose good base notes. I would recommend you guys trying this out yourself if you do have the raw materials because I do think it was worth the time taken and I definitely did learn quite a few things from it. So that's it. If you did enjoy this video then let me know. Maybe one time I could do one of the other formulas um, that were given in those Reddit posts as well. If you guys are interested in that then just let me know. I'll probably have to get in some of the raw materials for it. Thank you for watching the video and if you want to see more like this then subscribe to my channel and check out my channel page for all of the past videos I've done about perfumery.